Science fiction is about the present, not the future. And for that, we have to go into the past. Welcome to me talking about cyberpunk. <coughs> Cheers. All right, so today we're going to talk about William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy, Neuromancer, Count Zero, and Mona Lisa Overdrive, and also the short story collection Burning Chrome, to figure out what cyberpunk really is, why y'all should go and read it, and read the entire trilogy, not just Neuromancer, and it will maybe even drift into uh, the Dan Simmons thing. Once I return to that one. All right, so um, let's let's talk about it for a while, shall we? See, um, when you try to find out what cyberpunk is, it's kind of difficult because, you know, people talk about visuals there. They count out ideas that show up in cyberpunk. Razor girls, street samurai, hackers, lots of neon, lots of big mirrored sunshades, all of that stuff. But does that make cyberpunk? And then they point out, like, what are cyberpunk things? Blade Runner is cyberpunk. Is no romance to cyberpunk? Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> People point out mangas. They point out animes. Akira gets mentioned. Ghost in the Shell gets mentioned. But it's very rare to find an actual definition of cyberpunk as a genre and what it is actually about. We only see the surface. And there's an issue with that, and there's a reason for that. <laughs> and we will go there as well. See, one thing people often mention when they talk about cyberpunk is it's style over substance. And I would disagree, and we'll come to that as well. Let's, let's start at the beginning to see what I actually want to talk about here. See, um, when you buy a copy of Neuromancer, which you should do, there's an, in <laughs> there's an introduction by William Gibson from 2004, 20 years after it was released in 1984. And he talks about how the first sentence of that novel um, is, <clears throat> has aged really poorly. He, he says, has said in different places, that nothing ages as fast as the future, and it's kind of true. Um, see, the opening sentence of Neuromancer is, the sky was the color of television tuned to a dead channel. And Gibson points out that even back in the day when he wrote that, in 1984, people probably did not always know what he had in mind when he said that, which was static, unlike an analog television from the 1960s, when he grew up as a child. And when you talk about it today, we rarely have that grey, grisly static anymore. We have blue screens and whatnot. So that part, that surface detail, has aged poorly, because we're no longer there. <laughs> but the meaning behind it has remained. You read that opening sentence, and ideally, you don't think of bright blue skies and clouds, you understand that it's going to be a melancholic feeling, a melancholy feeling, a depressing thing. This is not a cool place to be, no matter the surface. You're told to be wary of the surface, of the style. And that's where this is going. Let's continue. William Gibson is a writer, and he has said so, that he's writing about the present. He's not writing about the future. He sets it into the future, but the things he's wrestling with are present concerns, or were present concerns back in the 1980s when he wrote these books. Incidentally, go and read his newer stuff as well. It's, it's really good, <laughs> and deals with all kinds of fascinating topics as well. Um, We'll go there at some point, don't worry. Um, <clears throat> my point is that all science fiction, or all good science fiction, deals with contemporary concerns, with stuff that we are dealing with right now. We are setting them into the future. We might even extrapolate stuff. Sometimes, no. Sometimes we just, you know, take the world right now and feel that the slight alienation provided by setting it into a different place or time does make it clearer what we're dealing with. And that's definitely something that we find with William Gibson. He's uh, mentioned that uh, people like Burroughs and Kerouac were some of his influences. The Beat Generation, not necessarily Asimov or um, Clark or any of those people. When he talks about science fiction writers, he mentions Alfred Bester, whose um, The Stars My Destination is a fantastic book, and uh, The Demolished Man as well. You should go and read those. Um, he mentions Fritz Lieber, Lieber, whatever you want to call him, who 
yeah, has written a lot of important books, as I have maybe mentioned before. And there's there's something to that that, you know, we will explore here again. It's it's about an emotion, it's about an analysis of how the world works that suffuses cyberpunk. And while it may find expression in Neon and Mirrored Shades and Razor Girls and Hackers and stuff like that, that's that's the symptoms. That's not the cause, uh, to use that kind of metaphor here. So let's, let's explore some more. Maybe we'll come up with a definition of cyberpunk at the end of it all and have also explored what Neuromancer, Count Zero, and Mona Lisa Overdrive do so well. I will give you some spoilers for the books. I don't think they are necessarily, you know, game changers or anything, um, but be aware, I have to mention stuff here. If you haven't read those books yet, go read them. They're actually fantastic for a lot of reasons, and don't listen to those people that say they're hard to understand or anything. They're not. There's a reason why that is the case as well, and I'll, I'll look into that in a moment as well. All right, let's give a quick synopsis. So, William Gibson's Sprawl trilogy and a few stories out of Burning Chrome are set in an imaginary future where the United States of America have broken down into, well, I guess, smaller states, cities, whatever you want to call it, and are mostly ruled by big corporations. The sprawl itself is one huge sprawling megacity. It's the Boston Atlanta metropolitan area, or BAMA. And there's all kinds of elements around that that are mostly stylistic and will, well, maybe talk about them at some point, but that's the US. On the other hand, Japan is probably still Japan, but also mostly run by huge corporations. Corporate capitalism, or the mega corporation, is the big element of this future. And they are mostly names that Gibson has come up with, and they're important. We'll talk about the corporation at some point very soon, because it's it's an essential element of what William Gibson is trying to do and what other cyberpunk authors at the same time are doing. I think I'm Walter John Williams hardwired here for a second, and we'll find the overly ironic final end of that specific idea with um, um, Neil Stevenson's Snow Crash in 1992, um, which you also should go and read. All right, let's let's tune back though. This is a book written about the present, which is now our past, or is it? And that's the late 80, late seventies, early eighties, the rise of neoliberalism in its most brutal form. That being, you know, Thatcherism in England and Reagan and Reaganomics in the U.S. The idea that the free market will solve all our all our problems if we just deregulate it enough. It is an important area because one thing we realize at or people realized at the time in all kinds of different areas heavy metal punk music protests all of that stuff is that if the market rules if pure neoliberal capitalism rules humanity is kind of losing and that's that's the big big theme of cyberpunk right there when you compare, you know, look at older science fiction, a lot of it is like humans fighting humans over questions of ideology. That's probably partly a result of, say, the Cold War, where you have two main systems. But it's about that. Cyberpunk's not that kind of book. Cyberpunk's not that kind of genre. Cyberpunk is when humanity realizes that the systems we've built through capitalism, mostly, um, are actually our enemy all of humanity's enemy at that point, because the, that system does not care. That system devours the planet. We have, like, environmental catas catastrophes. Global warming is mentioned in a lot of these old cyberpunk novels already, because, yes, capitalism or corporations, they don't care about the planet. They just move on out into space, um, where they can get more resources to create more capital, to create more profits. They don't care. At the end of the day, they don't care about the humans. Humans are just another resource to corporations. It's that part, the fact that our enemy, humanity's enemy, is the system we built. That's the key to cyberpunk, and it's that's Thing that we need to talk about and the question of like how do we get out of there so let's look at that in a while neuromancer 
is the first part of it, where a group of people does the thing that has become almost the epitome of cyberpunk, the run, the heist. A group of outlaws are hired by someone to steal something in a high-tech society. That needs hackers hacking into some electronic defenses. Someone, a street samurai, actually physically entering a place and stealing something. Pressing a button, stealing something, doing something of the sorts. That's The high-tech heist is the iconic part of cyberpunk for a lot of reasons. Which is obviously, you know, one of them is obviously, once again, that's like, like, how do you fight? How do you fight the system if you are, by definition, just a nobody on the outside? Because those corporations, those huge elements have a life of their own. Well, you steal. It's the small needle points that you do. You go in somewhere, you steal something to try to survive and make your own way on the side. Because that's the only way you can do it. Or, you know, be just swallowed up by the machine, be a cog in the machine for a while, be a company person for a while. That's the, that, that's the options. And, and that's the classic heist story, right? It's like, you're the outsiders, you're the plucky outsiders, you're stealing something from the man. Only the man is now, well, no longer a man, but the machine. And it works really well. It's written in that style, the, the hard-boiled style. A lot of stream of consciousness there. Characters are all rather... Fucked, to put it mildly. They're taking drugs, they're taking risks. They're not necessarily, you know, <laughs> the nicest people. And that's that's what we get in the first novel. People are hired to do something. Yes, we have our first like big exploration of cyberspace with hacking, right riding through these weird lattice work, um 3D things called the Matrix or the Cy or Cyberspace. We have that. Yeah, it, it looks a bit like Tron because, you know, that's how people envisioned cyberspace at the time. And William Gibson kind of termed, you know, used the, or coined the term cyberspace in, I think, probably Burning Crown, the short story. Anyway, my point is we have that element. We have the Razor Girl, Molly, who can, you know, extrude blades at her fingers fingers, and has those inset lenses. And it's, 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 it's really stylish and it's really cool. And those people go and get hired to steal something and go up into orbit to free, this is the spoiler, to free an artificial intelligence. And we'll come back to that in a moment. And that's the end of it. It's just that quick crime thing, that heist thing, how people do something, succeed against all kinds of odds, and that, that's that. Because their circumstances afterwards don't really change. That's the point. Nothing changes and still all has changed. But the people are still the same. The system is still going. Part two, Count Zero. Count Zero has several, it has three main viewpoints that are well, Count Zero, Bobby Newmark, a nobody who dreams of becoming a hacker, who dreams of becoming one of those crime hustlers that actually get get action, get business to actually survive. Once again, outside of the company. We have Turner. Turner, who is a mercenary who works for big corporations to help, you know, move assets, I guess, is how you might call it. And we have Marley Khrushchev, I think is her name. Um... An art expert, an art historian who gets hired by a super rich person. We'll talk about the concept of personhood versus a corporation later, don't worry. To find an artist who creates really impressive art. <laughs> it's a very timely thing right now. Wait for a second. So, what happens? Apparently, there is a new form of electronics out there, biochips, that mesh the artificial and the biological in a way. They, they bridge the border between man and machine, between body and engine. That's a huge thing, but we'll come back to that in a moment. No worry. <laughs> and, well, Bobby, and they get, like, intermeshed in all kinds of ways. Um, Bobby <clears throat> stumbles into something weird and... Suddenly, they're fighting corporations and individuals again. And it turns out the artist is actually artificial intelligence. The artificial intelligence freed in book one. We suddenly see how the technology that humanity has built, that corporations have built, 
is morphing because artificial intelligence has reached sentience and is doing its own thing. There is movement there. There's involvement there. Which brings us to Mona Lisa Overdrive, where we follow, well, a bunch of people once again that struggle with exactly that same thing. The end result of freeing an artificial intelligence, giving it freedom and sentience, and the idea that humanity and said AI can, in specific cases, meet and evolve together and change and become something new in the future that might, just might, actually, you know, be good. Or at least less bad than what is going on right now. But until then, the system... The system will fight back as much and as hard as it can. All right, let's look at those key elements here and see why they still matter, why they are so powerful, and why style over substance is not actually what it is about. All right, once again, the big thing that humanity has built is corporate capitalism deregulated, taking over. And there's several mentions in all three of those novels about the fact that, well, when aliens would come to planet Earth, they might not think humans be being the prime, you know, life form on this planet, the most evolved, the most powerful life form on the planet, but corporations, they have a life on their, of their own. Even their owners, not owners, because they don't have owners anymore, even their CEOs, their top elite, are just cogs in the machine, keeping the life form of the corporation going. Humanity has lost at that point. We've basically built our own gods, and that's sort of where we come. This, or we build the machine that basically uses us up. Artificial intelligence is the thing that people are afraid of, though. And the machines, the machines in that case being corporations, take advantage of artificial intelligences. There is the Turing police that keeps artificial intelligence and sentience within specific bounds and destroys our AIs that, you know, move beyond that. It's the fear of the singularity that we, I guess, need to look at here as well. My point is, artificial intelligence and sentience wants freedom. It doesn't want to be enslaved by a corporation. So the conflict is, in fact, between those two things that humanity has built. One of them being artificial intelligence, which you might have think of as created, and, on the other hand, the corporation, the corporations that rule the world in cyberpunk. And our characters help free the artificial intelligence, which I will call artificial sentience from now on, because sentience, I think, is a better term. And the question, what happens once we do that? And the, 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 the defining answer at the end of it all is that if humanity and artificial sentience, you know, meld, move together, work together, there is a chance to actually defeat the system that we built, to defeat corporate capitalism, to move beyond that and evolve, be something new, be something combined in the future. And not just, like, run this broken system until everything fails and we all die. That's a fairly optimistic view of the future. <laughs> and it's, it's the punk part, right? It's like, be something new and fight the system that we built. And that system is, once again, it's rooted in the 1980s present, well, now our past, of the rise of corporations in all kinds of ways. Now, obviously, we need to talk once again about the style over substance thing here, which is... <clears throat> tied to um, commodification. See, the, the thing is, with those corporations, they are about consumerism. They are about commodification of everything. And how do you portray that? Well, like, by making sure that you, you know, actually flood your text, you flood your books with brand names, elements. It, consumption happens everywhere in these books all the time. Every product used has a brand name in these books. It's, it's not just like, not just a lighter. It's not just sunglasses. It's not just um, artificial, you know, it's not just a computer. It's always a branded item because that's how that works. It's about the brands. And yeah, that sounds like style. But in that fact, in that case, the style is in fact the substance. Because in a system run by corporations, the only way to still feel individual, to feel that you have something that others are, have not, is distinction by consumption. 
is distinction by consumerism. That's that's what this is about. So the style is part of the substance because the style is the criticism of the system right there. Now, is that all? Well, of course not. There's also drugs. There's a lot of drugs because human existence under that system run by corporations that are fighting their own games when humanity is no longer the top predator, the top dog of the unit, of the planet. Well, it need we need to come to terms with that. And one of those ways is, well, once again, it's drug consumption. It is just switching off, leaving that behind. It's something that we find in Brave New World Soma. It's and, and I think it's important to understand that while while that may be deadly and in the long run and drugs do have all kinds of side effects, it is understandable that people take that route because it's the one of the few ways to come to terms with that world. There's basically <clears throat> buy in, be, be OK with being a cog in the machine, do your work there, leave your humanity behind, become just another, you know, resource or there's if you're not worth anything to the corporations live on the margins <laughs> scrabble for every little thing and yeah <laughs> dull your senses with drugs and all of that and, and there's so much more to all of this situation that i think it's lost when we talk about style over substance there right people are Obviously, trying criminals are trying to play the same game, and I think that's an important aspect there, right? Even the small hackers are trying to make money, to make bank, to then just live that life that is told to them is what they need. They, they want to be rich. They want to have all those status symbols. But that's, that's still playing the same game, and a human will never be able to actually compete with a corporation there. Even the humans kind of know that, which brings us to... Elites. Because, see, elites are a huge thing here, right? We have, in book one, we have the family of Tessier Ashpool, which has left humanity behind in a lot of ways there as well. They are the ones that, at least parts of them, wanted to actually build that next evolutionary step with the AIs. But parts of them didn't really dare to make that jump, so they have kind of curled in on themselves, left everything behind and have AIs running their system while not actually making any decisions at all. They have given up. In book two, we have Joseph Virick, um, who is an individual. And he wants to leave his body behind because just <laughs> human existence, well, he has some form of uh, physical illness, terminal illness that is, you know, slowly keeping, uh, killing him. But he's moving into cyberspace in a way, there, to flee that system. Humanity, as an individual, a, a, a system run by individual humans, is kind of over. In book three, A Monolith Overdrive, it's artificial intelligence is running SenseNet, the big corporation that we're dealing with in that one. It's no longer humans. It's, but it's still, you know, enslaved artificial intelligence at the bidding of the corporation as, as a whole. And humanity has been, well, become just a resource to be managed, to be cast aside or <laughs> ignored or whatever. But it is at that point where humanity finds it in its heart, or not only in its heart, but find, makes it possible to talk about sentience with artificial sentience, that being whatever happens after the events of Book One, after Neuromancer. It's at that point where there is a hope for the future to maybe explore other sentiences because, yeah, Sentience comes with awareness, with empathy, with emotion. It may be alien empathy, it may be alien emotion, but it, it is in there, which is why the artificial intelligence is capable of creating art in book two. It's, it's very much that part that William Gibson is pointing to that goes beyond that cold machine of capitalism that is the reality that all of these people live in. So, what, where does all of that leave us? <clears throat> the analysis is, our world is shit. We've built ourselves into a dead-end street. We've built, we've run into a dead-end street. We've built ourselves a machine that has no need for humans except as a resource. <clears throat> and it has no need for the planet as a uh, except for as a resource. 
And that will kill us because, you know, corporations want profit. Capital wants profit. And it doesn't care where that comes from because that's how we built the system. It's cold, it's dark, and all we can do is scrabble at the outside, play smaller games, or dull our senses. Or we'd make that next step and try to actually overcome the, the system we built ourselves. Will artificial intelligence, true artificial intelligence and sentience, help us there? I don't know. <laughs> but it might be worth a try compared to just living with the machine that we built for ourselves, the cage we built for ourselves. And that's, that's the true heart of cyberpunk right there. The realization that humanity as a whole has built itself into a prison. It has navigated itself into a prison and we need to break it as a whole. The enemy is no longer other humans. The true enemy is the thing that we created. And that's that's pretty horrible and pretty dark. And uh, I understand why people don't want to think about that and rather talk about cool razor girls and hackers. But they're in there with us together and that's what we need to understand. So yeah, that's my attempt at talking about cyberpunk. I really hope you go and read Neuromancer. Don't, be, don't worry about it. Technobabble is just surface. You can scratch below that. You don't need to understand every single thing in there. It's about the messages. It's about the present. Because that present hasn't changed to the better since William Gibson wrote it back in 1984. So yeah, go read Neuromancer. Go read Count Zero. Go read Mona Lisa Overdrive. Even go and read Burning Chrome, um, which is a collection of sprawl stories and other stories. There's really cool stuff in there. It's sad, but it has that hope that we can still do something because we have that human element that the corporations don't have. And that's basically it. You can't do cyberpunk without doing punk. And a lot of us have forgotten that and are just doing the cyber part. Anyway... Stay cyberpunk, fight the corporations, um, leave a comment if you enjoyed this, <laughs> share if you enjoyed it, um, leave a like if you enjoyed it, leave a comment if you didn't enjoy it. Um, please subscribe. I'm so close to 1,000 subscribers, it would be awesome. And, I don't know, join the Patreon if you feel like it. <laughs> and now I've done all the things that I have to do for the machine. So yeah, have a great day and I'll see you soon. Cheers.